<coughs> okay, so that was a bit rushed, but well, we made it, and <laughs> and you just managed to get here on, on time. Yeah, yeah, just about. Cool. Okay. okay, so it's all good. So thanks. We have John Alderson with us, who's like one of the uh, SEO gurus and semantic SEO for that matter, and that's why you're here to talk about you know. He's worked basically on a very interesting thing, which is a kind of specification on how you can use JSON LD to to boost your uh, your SEO, basically. So, you know, we're already running late, so I'll keep it very very short, and it's off to you. Thank you very much. Cool. Okay. Um. Yeah. Let's run through this. So. Um. My name is John. I work for a company called Yoast. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with that. Um, if you're not, we are an open source software provider, um, very deeply baked into the WordPress ecosystem. Um, we have software that runs on circa 10 million or so websites that helps people optimize their SEO, yada, yada, yada. Um, my job is mostly R&D, um, looking at where the future of Google is going, what companies like Facebook and Amazon are doing, and how that shapes the fundamentals of the web. And over the last 18 months or so, I've been having lots of conversations with people from Google and other companies, trying to get a feel for what are their priorities, what are they trying to achieve, and where are their main areas of focus, so that I can make sure that our roadmap is building for that future. The theme I see consistently throughout all of those conversations with the biggest influencers on the web is the importance of structured data. I can tell you that Google, Amazon, Facebook, Wikipedia, eBay, many of the companies you work for are all in an arms race to create, to curate, to take advantage of structured data at scale on the web. And their existing adoption into these areas and the existing things they're already doing today is radically changing the web and what it means to build websites, to compete online, to build new services, all of these things are already radically evolving. So I want to tell you, without plugging Yoast too much, because that's incredibly tedious, um, what I've been up to over the last 12 months or so, I think we've had an interesting breakthrough in some new stuff, and I'd like to share some of that story. Um, first of all, tiny bit of a history lesson in no more than one minute. I want to talk to you about how Google used to work, because that really sets the foundations. And the principle, as I'm sure many of you are aware, this is really, really basic, is they essentially just crawl the web. They do that at an incredible scale with incredible sophistication, but all they're doing is going out, collecting data, following links, and trying to pass it and understand the context and the content within that information. From that content, it's understands topics and concepts and relationships and tries to build some kind of model of relevance and authority. And there's a huge amount of nuance to how that works and how it's changed over time, but essentially that has been the bedrock of what SEO and digital marketing has been for the last 20 or so years. The thing is, Google's vision was never to provide you with a list of links. Many of your experience searching for things on Google will be, here is a subset of results. Here are 10 things you can pick from. Here are 10 blue links and some pictures. And it's up to you as the user to choose which one you think is best. That was never their end game. And in fact, any scenario where you as a user search and then have to use your brain to select the best answer is a failure on their part. And they talk about this very openly. Their mission has always, to be, has always been to become the Star Trek computer that just solves problems rather than some kind of facilitator that makes you choose. In the last few years, I think we're starting to see, well, even more recently than that, we're starting to see the evidence of this new evolution. What we're seeing increasingly is things like this. This is a set of search results for a whole, a whole bunch of different searches, but none of them look like a conventional set of links. They are rich experiences and cards where I can buy the thing, I can watch the movie, I can cook the thing, I can book the table reservation. I can go and undergo really complex processes, like minutely analyzing and comparing the difference of attributes of certain sets of vehicles and cars and comparing different sets of information. To do this and to achieve this and to do it at scale across different industries and different types of concepts, the web as it stands is not enough. The content they have access to and scrape and crawl and consume isn't structured enough. In order to achieve this level of interactivity and this level of rich experience, they need a better source of input. And increasingly, this isn't an isolated scenario. This is a piece of research from um, a guy called Rand Fishkin, who's very well known in the SEO space, and a company called Jumpshot, who harvest ISP data and resell it. They're saying that now over 50% of all searches done on Google don't result in a click. Take a moment to consider that. That's not, that half of people who search aren't not finding what they want, aren't going away and not finding what they need. Their needs are being met directly in the search results. They're undergoing actions, they're booking tables, they're completing their tasks in situ. This is really what Google wants to achieve. However, the systems they're using to drive this revolution in ecosystem are still based on crawling the web, extracting content, and trying to work out what the hell it's about. And I think they've got about as far as they can with that approach. This is an arbitrary recipe from the internet. I found it the other day, a bit further back than that. Um, how long does this take to cook? 
It's ambiguous. It's conflicting. The information doesn't quite add up. The maths isn't right. And there are many, many, many millions of pages like this containing content like this across the web where it's very easy for Google to understand this is a recipe. These are the things it's about. It's very, very hard for them to structure and expose that in a way that people can take action on it directly in the search results or on their Google Homes or on their phones. The content isn't good enough. It's not structured enough. Google can extract it, but they can't understand it. And they know that this is a problem. All of their current approach is based on large-scale extraction, and the inputs they're using aren't good enough. You can't throw more machine learning processes at this and get it right. It's a problem of precision, not of scale. That's why when you talk to these companies and all the people involved in addressing this challenge, they very openly talk about how structured data is for them the next war. They're investing huge amounts of resources and people and time and attention in trying to solve this problem. And there's a reason for that. It's because the next decade or so and the next sets of billions and billions of dollars of revenue for Google, for Amazon, for the other big players come from personal assistance, from your Google Home device, from your mobile phone, from your Amazon Alexa, from your Xbox, from your phone, from your um, thing that you run in your kitchen that tells you recipes. This is their future source of revenue. And Google knows that at the moment, Amazon is winning. Google's approach is to extract and structure the content, try and work out what the content's about. Amazon's approach is to pay developers huge amounts of money to solve the problems heuristically. They can't win based on their current approach, which is why in 2011, as many of you know, they got together with Yahoo and Bing and Yandex, Baidu, one of the others, you'll know, Yandex, um, and created schema.org. Many of you will be very, very familiar with it. Um, this is their answer to how do we solve structured data on the web. Imagine a product. It's um, suddenly represented by a structured graph. It has a price and a manufacturer, and that manufacturer is an organization that has employees that wrote this web page that's on this website that's connected to this organization. If we can start to structure and write our content using this kind of language and markup, Google can very easily understand and extract that and start to build and fuel its own knowledge graphs, which it can then use in turn to power the kinds of solutions they need to offer rich experiences, to show you recipes and search results, to allow you to book the table. 2011 was a long time ago. And market methods and the approaches they tried to try and get people to do this and to try and implement it failed horribly. Um, microformats failed, RDFA failed for a whole bunch of reasons, mainly because Google's marketing of it was particularly terrible, but also because market methods that are tied to data methods which are tied to your markup, like microdata and um, RDFA, are very, very brittle and break very easily. And if our problem, like with the recipe, is that people can't be trusted to accurately describe their content, when you give them incredibly brittle and inflexible tools to do that, that where the content changes over time and they have to be expected to understand the intersect between their code and their markup, it just doesn't work at scale. It's an incredibly fragile system. JSON LD has solved a huge, amount, a huge part of that. Obviously, there are many formats that you can write this kind of stuff in. You can define all of your properties. JSON LD is increasingly the only format that Google will really want you to use as we move forward. This is the future of how they want to consume structured data on the web. So suddenly, Google are producing reams and reams of documentation and support and tools and incentive for adoption. It's an incredible commercial impetus for them to get people to adopt this quickly before Amazon wins and gets a land grab in the, um, in the connected devices and personal assistance space. This is full of nuance and complexity and conflict, which we'll come on to. Um, so in response to this, a lot of the content management systems and publishing tools on the web have baked in and added support for, I want to describe my content in structured data. Um, they typically make provisions to allow authors to define what their pages are about. This is a screenshot from a Yoast competitor, so I don't seem too biased, called Rank Math. Um, they allow you to say, what is this page about? I'm, I'm an author writing a page, or a blogger writing a post, or a content manager describing a product. I can say, this is an article. And an article has properties like an author that I can connect to, a published date, a featured image, a description. I can define these things. I can say, this page contains an article. But when we look at what Google is trying to achieve and what they need to achieve in order to deploy this kind of rich structured data, it's not enough to say, this page has an article. I need to say, this article is part of a page which was authored by this person who works for the organization who runs the website, which incidentally is described over here, which is a parent of this page that has these relationships to these other things. It's not enough to say there is an article. I need to describe the relationship between the article, the page it's on, the website it's in, and the organization who publishes that. You see, the web is more than just pages. And all of the current solutions out there that allow you to play with this kind of stuff work on the assumption that it's enough just to describe your page. You can say, this page contains an organization and an article. It's harder to say, this article was written by John Smith, who is an employee of the organization who published the website that this article is in. 
That's the level of detail and description we need to get to in order to fuel this future. That's a graph, truly linked data, and most solutions don't go this deep. This is another example from the same tool. I can say this page is about a book. It has an author, and I can describe it. What happens if the book is also a product? And what happens if the organization who manufacture and retail the book is different from the organization who published the website I'm selling it on? It's incredibly hard to describe these complex relationships using text fields in an editor. This isn't how you author and maintain large, complex, interrelated graphs at scale, yet this is the only solution out there on the web at the moment. This is JSON without the linking. The approach of picking what a page is about and filling in the fields manually doesn't scale. And manually authoring and maintaining graphs in that way just isn't feasible. This bothered me greatly. If we rewind back to November, I think, last year, and this was keeping me awake at night, you've essentially got a problem where technology isn't smart enough to understand what stuff is about. Users can't be trusted enough to manage and author what their stuff is about. And businesses and software can't conceptualize how they would even go about doing this. So I set myself a challenge. I said, how can we enable everybody to have rich graphs which represent their content, business, and products? Everybody. How can we do all of that automatically, invisibly, perfectly at scale, based just on the content that people write and manage? And how can we make all of that conceptually and technically scalable and interoperable beyond our little Yoast ecosystem, beyond our bigger WordPress ecosystem, beyond PHP, into the whole web and everything that anyone builds ever? TLDR, I think we've done it. And I want to tell you about some of the challenges that we went through along the way and then show you some of the stuff and hopefully get you guys involved and excited on um, where we go from here. So. This was obviously an absolutely insane thing to commit to, and I've spent the last year of my life deeply ensconced in it. Um, I'll walk you through some examples of where there were particularly interesting challenges um, that you might stumble across if you're trying to do similar stuff. Um, isn't schema.org a pain? Um, it's really phenomenally good at describing the properties of things. A house has an address. A business has a name. Nowhere does any of this documentation tackle context or the real world, or the relationship between things. If I have an article written by an author who works for a company that's represented by a different site, but the author wants to remain anonymous, there is no documentation, there is no mental model, there is no description, there is no word of content on the entire web about how you go about doing that. All this does is it describes the properties things can have. There is no um, support for um, what are the rules, what are the contexts, what are the awkward edge cases. That's a pain. Couple that with the fact that Google's rules are incredibly finickety. Um, an article um, must have an author and a publisher. But in Google's world, a publisher cannot be a person. That's odd. I wrote a blog post yesterday. I am the publisher of that. If you feed that to Google, they flag it as an error. You are not eligible for Google's interpretation of your structured data if your article was authored by a person. That's an arbitrary business decision by them, based on their priorities and their interpretations of schema's fairly ill-defined rules and context. A logo of a news article has different requirements than one for an organization, but you have to have both. And if I'm running on something like AMP or a mobile-first display, my logo has to be a different size, but my organization can only have one logo, and I'm serving a responsive page. There is no solution to these kinds of challenges. You have to make a best guess and hope that they get it right. Huge amounts of trial and error and faffing, and there is no documentation or standardization for how this should work in the real world. Um, increasingly, this is getting sillier as well as Google, so I'll talk more about this in a minute, but um, an article must have a main entity of page property. An article has to be related to a page. But an FAQ block has to be the main entity of a page, which is a, a directionally opposite relationship. Bit different bits of Google have designed their graphs in different ways, and I now can't have an article which contains an FAQ about a product because there's no way to reconcile the directionality of the graph. Now, schema.org defines the properties these can have. Google defines an entirely different set of logic, and somewhere in between is all the mess that we have. Increasingly, Google's tools are also not particularly... This is just a huge rant against Google, but it's worth understanding just how messy this is because I'm going to implore you all to get involved and try and fix it. Um, this is um, somebody complaining on one of our blog posts that our schema implementation shows errors in Google Search Console um, testing tools um, because their how-to guide doesn't have a tool or um, a supply. If I write a how-to guide of how to turn this laptop on, do I really need to list that it needs us to supply a laptop and a finger? And if I don't, Google complains and treats it as an error. Furthermore, um, this is a screenshot of a search result um, with some FAQ content. Um, the data type for an FAQ answer is text, 
Text is a very well-defined thing. Text cannot and should not contain HTML markup, but that's an affiliate link from that website to an Amazon product served in Google's search results because their specification allows you to put some HTML in. That's me, it's not me, but that's somebody essentially hacking and hijacking onto Google via their own schema in order to make money off their platform. This is really poorly and inconsistently designed. And then furthermore, their tools are inconsistent. These are two reports for the same page on Yoast.com. One of them says that this is not eligible and there are errors. The other shows exactly the same data and says that it's fine. Within Google and their interpretation of schema.org, they can't agree on what right looks like. I think this is particularly interesting and something for all of you to think about is um, Google's mental model for the web requires that a page be about a topic. And that's born of the way that they approach and think about SEO and paid search and a whole bunch of other things. But I'm not necessarily sure that it's a strict requirement for the web. Why can't a page be about six different things? Why do we have to have this strict relationship between a URL and a topic and a concept? Technology is certainly more flexible than that. Our mental models can be. But they enforce this. And as they progress with rolling out schema, this is going to become more and more fixed in the very nature of the web. It's something we ought to certainly think about and decide whether or not we're happy about it. The kinds of graphs we construct suddenly end up being anchored to this mental model. I don't know if that's good. And then across all of this, there is no context. There is no set of instructions. There are no guidelines. If an organization has a logo that is this big, but the article has no author, what should my graph contain? Which bits do I show? Which bits don't I show? How do the relationships shift? None of this is defined anywhere. And then on top of all of this, nobody has a simple website, right? You're running a CMS and also a tag management solution and some third-party extensions, all of which have properties which really ought to be represented in a graph. If I'm running um, something like WordPress and I've got an article and an e-commerce plugin that re references a product and a recipe system, all of these things should talk to each other. But there is no defined way that describes how they can, which makes it particularly difficult because um, there is no defined structure for how ID, sh I how ID should work on the web. Every property in schema.org um, can have an ID. And when you start to build complex graphs, IDs are how you cross-reference entities and link them together. But there is no standardized model for what an ID should be. It's an arbitrary string. So if I, as tool provider A, use approach X for my strings, and tool provider B uses an entirely different approach to writing their IDs, there is no way that our solutions can interoperate. None of this is defined anywhere. And then to top it all off, Google don't actually pass the graph. This is pretty terrifying when I found out about it. Talking to their teams, um, they look for just string matches in the content of your JSON-LD and extract the relevant topics and content. Nobody at Google is actually passing the graphs that we're producing, which makes it pretty scary because they're just using arbitrary logic to say if it contains this bit, then extract it. And they're also saying, um, for example, um, we'll only extract this bit and use it if it's a leading edge in a relationship. They will only show your logo if it's attached to an organization where the organization's on a leading edge. But organization is quite frequently not on the leading edge because it's two or three steps back from the web page and the thing on the web page you want to represent. All of this is a mess. And lastly, I think Google don't support, and there's a lot of anti-Google here, but it's worth understanding that they are really pushing this, but they're not doing a good job because it impacts all of us. They don't support cross-page IDs. So if I have an article written by an author and a product sold by a company, and I want to say these are on the same, these have shared relationships, and they're both run by the same organization. It's not enough to say, this article was written by an author who is represented by this page over here. I have to build that entire graph on every page. I have to say, here is an author who works for a company who authors a web page, which is part of a website, which is run by an organization, which sells a product, which has these details, which is written about by the same author. I have to build and construct and manage that entire graph in every single instance. And then content within the graph changes the graph recursively. As the graph is constructed, it needs to know about what else is in the graph, otherwise it all goes horribly wrong. If my article contains FAQ content, the web page becomes an FAQ page. So as I'm traversing through and managing and passing all of this, I need to be traveling in multiple directions to refactor what the thing thinks it is. Thankfully, WordPress solved a big chunk of this. Um, in January-ish, WordPress launched um, a new editor called Gutenberg, which some of you might be familiar with. And the principle was that as you author your content, everything is a block. A paragraph is a block. A recipe is a block that contains blocks. An FAQ list is a block of questions and answer blocks. And as you start to author content in blocks, they are inherently structured. What we have now is something actually much closer to the original microformat specification in RDFA, where my content is tied to my structured data. 
And you obfuscate all of that away from the user, and they just write things. And out the back pops the schema. Content all, this is um, our Yoast how-to block I'm writing, me, but writing a um, how do I do X, and you fill in the steps and the answers, and in the background it just spits out. What's more is that, rather, as well as just tying the content to the schema, everything, because it's in the content format, is also addressable via um, all of WordPress's APIs, their backend systems, and you can start to do some schema stuff that doesn't rely on passing web pages and front-end experiences. I can build systems that just query the data without having to worry about the website. And that's not only it. Um, this actually isn't WordPress at all. This is Drupal. This is Gutenberg editor in Drupal running um, a whole bunch of our Yoast schema code. This is increasingly becoming the way that people will author content on the open web, and it makes it really, really easy to start tying in schema-like stuff. So fast forward <coughs> until summer-ish, I think. We got to the point where we launched this. Um, I would love you to go read it and feedback on it. It's on developer.yoast.com. Um, but I think this has solved all of the problems that I've identified and built a framework that all of you can build on. Essentially, as of reasonably recently, everybody running either Yoast SEO or Yoast SEO in any of our um, various flavors gets a complete graph that gets built on every single page just built on their content. To do that, they only have to configure initially whether they're a person or an organization. Everything else happens in the background. And then all the stuff that it does is documented here, and it's extensible. Why is that interesting? Because um, it's all open sourced. As well as Yoast itself being open source and Gutenberg being open source, we're open sourcing all the documentation. This is the heavy work and the heavy lifting that I've done that answers to all of those awkward problems that I've just described. If a how-to piece only has an image and an answer and doesn't have an author, how should the graph be built? All of those awful, awkward edge cases that have no rules now have rules. Standardized ID structures and scenarios you can anticipate, ways that describe which bits of the graph should stitch and unstitch to build something cohesive. Other software vendors, other programmers, other solutions can take this, build on it, extend it. We have a solution to making schema interoperable beyond just WordPress, beyond Yoast, beyond everything. Um, and if that's not enough, there's also an API which itself is open sourced and extensible, which allows you to say, I want to build something on top of this. And we're already seeing people building other WordPress plugins, other solutions, where they go, I want to take your graph and I want to inject a new node into it, or I want to extend it and change it. The output is something like this. This is um, a huge amount of raw schema in the background. I think I've got a better shot actually somewhere. Um, yeah. You can get a feel for it as it scrolls, just how nuanced and intertwined this is. Um, far beyond the degree that you could create manually. Certainly, there is no way that you could author this once as a developer and have it um, remain um, cohesive and interoperable when things change. There's no way you can rely on users to do this. All of this happens automatically in the background when I publish an article. It's derived from, we know the author, we know the content, we know the structure, we know the blocks. The core principle, if you're interested and you go read about this on developer.yoast.com, is we've created, um, we've only done one smart thing in this whole thing, which is use um, a graph wrapper which means that rather than just authoring conventional JSON-LD for Google, we put it in a structure, which means we can define an array of objects and we can cross-relate them by ID. We can say, I don't need to replicate and repeat myself every time I want to reference an organization. I can just highlight and reference an existing one by ID and the whole thing ties together. Um, which means that when people write stuff like this in Google, you get stuff like that where our whole content and our how-to guide is put in situ. I can swipe through. I don't have to visit the website. It's all there. It's nice. It's easy. That's really cool, I think. Um, what's next? So people are building on the stuff we've done. I would love to talk to you if you want to build on it as well. Um, I have an enormous roadmap that I will get told off if you get seen for seeing, but never mind, um, of all the stuff I want to build on it and expand into and new types of schema and refining some of the documentation. That's quite cool. One of the things that I would like to leave you with is thinking about if we all start standardizing on some of these ID structures and logic, um, it enables a world where maybe Google aren't as dominant as they are at the moment. I, I love the guys from Google. I work with them really closely. We've um, cooperated on a load of this. But this enables new types of things. If everybody's stroke schema is structured and consistent and interoperable, it would take me an hour to build a search engine that finds all of the opening times of every restaurant in Seattle. And I wouldn't need Google's budget or their calling abilities or their data processing or storage because it's consistent and it's predictable. And it's hard to envision the kinds of services we could build with that kind of infrastructure, but potentially particularly interesting. Um, it also skips out, skips out. Well, that's all I had. Um, thank you very much. I would love to talk to you about some of this. Um, this is not a pitch for Yoast. This is a pitch for, I think we've solved this together, and it'd be nice to extend on it and to build more and to change the world together. Thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions?
Anyone? Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm Simon. Um, just um, how closely tied is the um, information, uh, is the approach to WordPress? How closely coupled is it to WordPress? Um, at the moment, pretty closely, but all the conceptual stuff is decoupled. So if I skip back a bit to here, none of this is WordPressy. This is it's it's um, scenario based, and it doesn't matter what the back end is. So if the author wants to remain anonymous, you should remove their um, email address, which means they're no longer a valid author, which means that it's no longer a valid article, which means you should fall back to web page. You could do that on any system. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, thanks for the talk. So how does your approach to uh, identifiers differ from that of schema.org? Certainly you can define uh, cross-page identifiers using schema.org, RDFA, or JSON-LD. Yep. You can even make it into linked data if you want to. Um, so does your does Yoast approach um, differ more in terms of best practices, or is there actual tooling that... Uh, so we're, we're, we're bending to Google on this because Google explicitly can't stroke won't... Um, Builds not the right word, but understands networks that span multiple pages. They will only consume the structured data on a URL about the things on that page. So you can't, whilst technically you can say, actually, see over here for this, this node, you can't do that in a way that Google supports. So our approach relies on essentially constructing the complete connected graph for a page on each page. So every single page on the website will define the organization, the website itself. Um, some peripheral stuff like the breadcrumb structure, the search functionality, and then the stuff that's specific to that page and tie it all together into one graph. Yeah, it would be really, really nice to be able to do that and just distribute it and spread it, but um, there's no way we can do it with the way that Google works. And, and they, I don't think they have a clear mental model for this either, um, which is really bizarre, so I think we're stuck with this approach. Oh, but you can do both. I, I think there's just, they're lacking guidelines. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think strategically, um, so some insight into the way they work, um, they have a structured data team, but it's just a wrapper. What they, the way they work operationally internally is they have small teams which are focused on the individual types of schema they want to support. They have an FAQ team, a rich snippet, a, a, a how-to team. They don't talk to each other. They use differing standards, and there's no overarching ideology. So they're only interested in how do we get people to describe this page, and nobody's really talking about the, the web. Thanks. We'll, we'll have to wrap it up because we're running a bit late, but well, feel free to catch Jono. And Talk he's, he's also a panelist in uh, one of our panels coming up, so yeah. there will be more. Don't worry. Cool. Thank you very much. Cheers.